Homicide detectives responded to the scene and were briefed by uniformed officers already there. They questioned a witness, a nurse who had seen the fire start. She said she had arrived for work before dawn for the early morning shift. In the parking lot, she saw the truck go ablaze. She saw the outline of a figure with long hair run from the truck as the flames erupted. She never saw a face. And she had never seen the truck before. Investigators inspected the vehicle. The pattern of fire damage indicated it had begun in the cab and had burned very quickly. Investigators believed it had been intentionally set. An accelerant had been used, probably gasoline. The body inside appeared to be a female, but it was burned beyond recognition. Some items survived the fire, including a backpack, a camera, and a roll of undeveloped film. Technicians recovered several documents that bore the name Sandra Gallagher. By sunrise, detectives at LAPD's Van Nuys station had run the truck's plates. Okay, I'll, I'll call back. Through DMV records, Detective Mike Koblenz was able to confirm that Sandra Gallagher owned the truck. We'd done some work at the office and learned that uh, she was, in fact, married to uh, an individual, Steve, who lived in the Los Angeles area. We attempted to contact him and made arrangements to interview him at uh, Van Nuys Station. Detectives suspected it was Sandra in the truck, but identification through dental records would take a few days. Since the body was too damaged to identify, detectives asked Stephen Gallagher to look through the recovered evidence. He said the backpack, camera, and other items were Sandra's. The police department had developed a roll of film that survived the fire. Stephen identified his wife in the pictures. Most married homicide victims are killed by their husbands. Detectives asked Stephen about his relationship with Sandra. There's a lot of domestic violence, spousal abuse that goes on, so it's, it's, it's just a, a, a direction to go to initially. In our case, as it related to Sandra Gallagher, uh, once again, we wanted to eliminate the husband as a suspect and determine a little bit more about our victim, Sandra. Stephen said he had seen his wife on September 28th, the day before the truck fire. That day, the couple had met for lunch. He and Sandra were experiencing marital problems, and they had spent the last couple of nights apart. He should know, I would say, week after next. They had talked about reconciling. Who's that guy? Uh, sorry, the bar with you. The big guy in the leather jacket. But things were still strained between them. It's none of your business, okay? Stephen told detectives he last saw Sandra around 2 p.m., though he heard from his wife later that evening. He said Sandra called him from a local bar called McGrath's. I know. She was very excited and told him she had won $1,200 in the lottery. <laughs> Since that call, Stephen hadn't heard from his wife and had no idea where she had gone. There were a few other people. Uh, Detectives had to corroborate his story. Once he mentioned the Bar McReds, that was our direction. We wanted to get in there, find out who was the bartender, who the owner was, who was there that particular evening, and who could identify some photos of Sandra that we gathered from the truck. 
LAPD detectives visited the bar. When shown a photo of Sandra Gallagher, the bartender recognized the woman. Okay. What can you tell me about it? She knew her by her nickname, Sam. Had a lottery ticket. Hey. Guess what? The bartender confirmed that Sandra had been in the bar on the night of the 28th. She had told everyone about her lottery win. Some customers overheard the detective's questions and said they had also been in McRed's that evening. Can you tell me about her, when she was in here the other night? They also remembered Sandra and recalled one man who talked with her that night. These people in the bar had mentioned to us that uh, they recognized the photographs and they identified the photographs as a female by the name of Sam. This is the uh, name that they knew her by, was Sam. And everybody had mentioned she was with a person by the name of Glenn. Yeah. They described Glenn as having long blonde hair and a beard. He'd been coming in regularly for the past few days. That night, he seemed interested in Sandra and talked to her for quite a while. Okay. Glenn was friendly and came across as a big spender buying drinks for Sandra and the others. When the bar closed, Glenn had asked Sandra for a ride home. He said he lived nearby. She agreed to drop him off and they left together. The customers hadn't seen Glenn since that night. Yeah, she took him home. Do you know where he lives? They believed Glenn's last name was Rogers, but they weren't sure. Their description of him matched the one of the man seen fleeing the burning truck. If you think of anything else, please call me. Detective Koblenz would check the lead. Through department sources, we were able to identify Glenn Rogers as a resident in the Van Nuys area. And we were able to obtain photographs of Mr. Rogers. These photographs, in the next day or two, were shown to various witnesses at the bar in the form of a photo lineup. And Mr. Rogers was identified in this photo lineup as a person being at McRed's with Sandra Gallagher. Detectives secured a search warrant for Roger's apartment. It was only a few minutes away from where the truck had been burned. LAPD, search warrant! They didn't know if Roger's was inside, perhaps with a weapon. Uniformed officers entered first to clear the apartment. Roger's wasn't there. It looked like Rogers had cleared out in a hurry. Detectives recovered a purse and a woman's wallet. It was empty of cash and held no ID. No identification. They also found a woman's earring. The earring became significant in that uh, her husband, Steve Gallagher, identified that earring as one that he had purchased as a pair for uh, his wife a couple months earlier. After several days, the coroner made his report. He positively identified the remains from the truck as those of Sandra Gallagher. He determined that she had not burned to death. We learn in the nose area of our victim, there wasn't any presence of evidence of fire, sooting, and so on. That gave us information that uh, because she didn't breathe any of the fire, any of the soot, it gave us an indication that uh, she had died prior to the fire itself. The mother of three had been killed by manual strangulation. A 
Los Angeles detectives charged Glenn Rogers with Sandra Gallagher's murder and issued a warrant for his arrest. They entered Rogers' name and description into the NCIC, the National Crime Information Center, a database that links over 57,000 law enforcement agencies nationwide. That informs other agencies around the United States that Glenn Rogers, in this case, is in fact wanted in Los Angeles for murder. It would list the agency, Los Angeles Police Department, Van Nuys area, with my name and my phone number. If they have any contact with Glenn Rogers and happen to run him, this warrant would show up uh, in their jurisdiction and he'd be taken into custody. Detectives sought out anyone who knew Glenn Rogers. They learned he frequented local bars and worked odd jobs, mostly in construction. They visited several job sites, interviewing his friends and co-workers. Through witnesses and friends, we learned that Glenn uh, did have a temper, and that when he drank, he did become enraged. There was domestic uh, violence involved with uh, former girlfriends. So we knew we were dealing with someone who could become violent and generally violent when he drank, as it was in our case with Sandra Gallagher. One of his friends said he hadn't seen Rogers in a while, but promised to contact the police if he heard from him. Okay. A few days later, Rogers' friend called. He said Rogers had phoned him from a motel outside Jackson, Mississippi. Local police talked to the motel manager who told them Rogers' room number. Police, open up! The room was empty. The murder suspect was on the run. In the fall of 1995, the search continued for Glenn Rogers. Police believed he fled California after killing a woman there on September 28th. A tip led to a Mississippi motel, but Rogers had disappeared before police arrived. Police issued an APB locally. They hoped someone would spot the suspected killer before he left the area. Days later, on November 3rd, 1995, Jackson, Mississippi detectives responded to a murder. Family members had found Linda Price dead in her bathtub. The 34-year-old single mother had been stabbed repeatedly and her throat had been slashed. Investigators searched the apartment for evidence. Technicians photographed the scene and lifted numerous latent fingerprints. They found no murder weapon. No valuables seemed to be missing. There was no apparent forced entry, and the killer had locked the door when leaving. The details of the crime scene led Jackson homicide detectives to conclude Linda Price had been killed by someone she knew. In the morning, they interviewed her mother. Perhaps she knew the killer as well. She said her daughter had a new boyfriend. His name was Glenn Rogers. A month earlier, on October 3rd, Linda had met Rogers at the Mississippi State Fair where he had been working. He was charming, and Linda fell for him right away. They soon rented an apartment and moved in together. At first, Linda seemed happier than ever. But recently, she wondered if she'd made a mistake. She told her mother that Rogers had a bad temper, and she feared his mood swings. 
when Linda stopped calling and didn't answer her apartment door, her mother believed that Rogers had harmed her. Again, Rogers was nowhere to be found. Jackson detectives believed he had left the area. They entered his name into the NCIC database. Learning Rogers was wanted for murder in California, they contacted Detective Mike Koblenz in Los Angeles. Jackson, Mississippi at that time contacted me, informed me of a murder they had, and they wanted more information on Glenn Rogers as he was a possible perpetrator in that case. The murders followed a pattern. The victims in California and Mississippi had both been charmed by Rogers. They had been isolated from others, then brutally killed just before Rogers fled the area. The investigators believed that Rogers was on a rampage that probably would not stop until he was found. In our minds, we knew that we had a major problem going on here. We felt if he wasn't apprehended, that there could very well be more victims. Jackson police asked the public to call if anyone saw Rogers in the area. Witnesses reported sightings, but Rogers stayed one step ahead of authorities. The detectives contacted the FBI field office in Jackson. Hey, They believed Rogers had left the state like he did after the California killing. Agents filed a federal warrant for unlawful flight to avoid prosecution. Perhaps federal resources could help stop the killer. FBI Special Agent John Huber helped coordinate the multi-state investigation. Well, this case was very high speed, very fast. The murder he committed in Jackson was on November 3rd, it was Linda Price. Um, subsequent to that, he committed another murder on November 6th. On that date, police in Tampa, Florida, responded to a murder scene at a local motel room that had been rented by Glenn Rogers. Like Linda Price, the young woman lay dead in the bathtub, stabbed in the back, chest, and wrist. There was no ID of the woman in the room, but investigators noted a tattoo of a cross on her shoulder. Her jeans and shoes were piled near the toilet. A bracelet was found in the sink. From the evidence left behind, Tampa homicide detective Julie Masucci attempted to piece together the details of the murder. When we removed the clothing, it appeared that she had been stabbed through the clothing, which means that she was never undressed. Um, and it was from the rear portion, which appeared that someone might have come up behind her and stabbed her. The shoes had blood spots on the top, indicating she had them on and was standing when she was attacked. Under her body was a man's watch. Investigators believed it belonged to the killer. It was significant that she was placed in a bathtub and that it appeared that someone tried to clean up any evidence that they left behind. We had found towels to indicate someone had wiped up blood off of a floor. Um, it appeared that the bathtub water had been run to try and clean up any evidence that was left behind. The detective interviewed the housekeeper who discovered the body. That morning, she had been making her daily rounds just after checkout time. Outside room 119, she spotted a handwritten do not disturb sign. Housekeeping! She said she didn't clean the room the day before because she saw the sign and wanted to respect the privacy of the people staying there. 
On this day, the occupants were scheduled to have checked out. When she entered the bathroom, she made the gruesome discovery. Detectives asked the motel manager if she knew about the people staying in room 119. She recalled the man who rented the room because he requested a do not disturb sign the day before. They told him he didn't have one. So he paid for another night and told them at the registration that he did not want them cleaning his room. He wanted it to be left alone. Apparently he went back to the room and tore off a piece of a phone book and made his own do not disturb sign and he hung it on the door. The motel manager remembered the same man packing up a small white car that evening. He had paid for another night so she didn't think he was leaving. She warned him about recent break-ins at the motel and told him not to leave anything in the car overnight. The detectives checked the office records, finding the registration card for room 119. It had Glenn Rogers' name and signature on it. Technicians would later recover prints matching Rogers from the car. Detective Masucci ran a computer check and saw the California and Mississippi murder warrants. She contacted the other agencies and the FBI. Then we started to realize very quickly into the investigation that there was a possibility that this man, Mr. Glenn Rogers, was a serial killer. The investigators knew who the killer was, but Tampa detectives still had not identified the female victim. She remained at the morgue as Jane Doe. If they could identify her, it might help them find the man who had killed her and at least two others. In the fall of 1995, after linking murders in California, Mississippi, and Florida to one man, the FBI and local detectives searched for accused serial killer, Glenn Rogers. The latest victim had been found in a Tampa motel room. She was still unidentified. Responding to media coverage, a woman whose daughter had been missing for two days came forward. She positively identified the body of her daughter, Tina Marie Cribs. Tina had two children of her own. Tina's mother told Detective Julie Masucci about her daughter's last day. We learned that Tina had worked and that she went to the Showtime Bar, which is in Gibsonton and she met some friends there. She was supposed to meet her mother there. Apparently it's like a family bar where a lot of people go and, and there's televisions in there and they just go and gather and talk. Detectives visited the Showtime bar. The bartender said she knew Tina and her mother. She confirmed that Tina had been in the bar on November 5th. The bartender also remembered that a man named Glenn was there the same night. He talked with Tina and the others. He bought a round of drinks with a $100 bill. The bartender said the man was very friendly and won Tina over quickly. Eventually, he asked Tina for a ride home. He said his motel room was close and promised Tina would be back in time to meet her mother. Everything's taken care of, right? All right, great, thanks. Tina finally agreed and told the others she'd be right back. When the mother came to the Showtime bar, she sat there and waited, and her daughter didn't show up, so she said she started beeping her. 
to find out where she was. And she said that she had such a close-knit relationship with her daughter that she immediately knew something was wrong when she didn't answer her pages. Detective Masucci also learned that Tina owned a white Ford Festiva, the same kind of car the Tampa motel manager had seen Rogers packing with suitcases. She updated the NCIC report on Rogers, adding the Festiva and its license plate number to the fugitive's information. FBI Special Agent John Huber was surprised that Rogers wasn't trying to conceal himself. Glenn Rogers seemed to not care if he would get caught or had no fear of the law. He would always use his real name when dealing with people and checking into motels. He would drive cars that weren't stolen, either belonged to the, to the victim, which he could easily be linked to, or his own vehicle. Uh, he was a, he didn't seem to care. If people knew what was happening, he wasn't trying to hide. The search for the serial killer hit the news. TV stations across the Southeast broadcast pictures of Rogers, asking anyone spotting him to call authorities. Hundreds of leads poured into the FBI. One promising tip came from a Jackson, Mississippi motel. Two separate callers claimed to have seen Rogers there. Rogers had been in Jackson previously and was known to frequent small motels. We uh, set up a perimeter around the hotel and then we had an entry team go up to the door Agents were cautious until they could identify the man. We identified the person that resembled Rogers and determined that it was not him. We then later searched the entire hotel and began searching the hotels in the immediate vicinity, but uh, didn't find him. It was very important in this case to apprehend this individual as soon as possible because based on his history, he was going to continue to kill until he was apprehended. Authorities were desperate to stop him. The serial killer was out there somewhere, and it was likely that he was searching for his next victim. In the fall of 1995, suspected serial killer Glenn Rogers had been last seen in Florida. The FBI believed he had murdered a woman there after killing women in California and Mississippi. The FBI soon learned that Louisiana had been his next stop. On November 10, 1995, Andy Sutton, the mother of four, was found murdered in her Bossier City, Louisiana apartment. Like two others, she had multiple stab wounds to her upper body and back. So the Bossier City detective questioned the victim's roommate and former boyfriend. Nine o'clock. Andy's roommate was a waitress and had worked late the night before Andy was killed. When she returned home in the early morning hours, she heard the bedroom door close. She assumed it was Andy and her new boyfriend, Glenn Rogers, in the apartment's one bedroom. Blankets had been left on the couch, and so she slept there. After daybreak, she was awakened by someone at the apartment door. Would you tell Andy I'm here? It was Andy's ex-boyfriend. He wanted to talk to Andy. I don't care. I'd still like to see her. Andy? Andy? 
In the room, she found Andy's body under the sheet. She told detectives Andy had met Glenn Rogers in a bar. They had been dating for only a few days. Neighbors had seen Rogers leave in a white festiva. Bossier City detectives ran Rogers' name through the NCIC and saw the three other murder warrants. They contacted the other police agencies in the FBI. Los Angeles faxed a photo of Rogers to be used in the local investigation. Louisiana television stations picked up the story. Viewers were asked to be on the lookout for Rogers, but they were warned not to approach the deadly fugitive. Special Agent John Huber and the other investigators were frustrated. Yeah, you know it. Rogers was killing people faster than we could investigate where he, where he was. Uh, it was just a, a kind of a time game, and he was killing people faster than we could apprehend him. Hey guys, look at the FBI up. and local oh, detectives guys, believed yeah. Rogers murdered four women in six weeks. After each killing, Rogers had fled the state. Let's try, let's try to focus. The locations he chose were random. Despite their best efforts, investigators couldn't keep up. They needed to spread the description of Rogers and his vehicle across the country. Agents sent requests to truckers over their CBs to be on the lookout for a white Ford for Steve. They posted wanted flyers in truck stops and rest areas. We're not really sure where you're going next. That's why uh, they held press conferences to get Rogers' photo out to the public. And Gallagher has some of this out. They wanted to warn potential now, victims is, uh, and hope someone would spot the killer. Gallagher. Through the media, agents released details of Rogers' M.O. for finding victims and the route he traveled. Gallagher was viciously raped and murdered. The FBI the began the process of adding Rogers to their 10 most wanted list. Uh, the rear of a Getting someone on the 10 most wanted list increases the amount of resources that the Bureau puts into a case. It also uh, increases the amount of media attention that's also uh, worked into a case. The tips began to increase. One caller claimed Glenn Rogers was at a pool hall in Mississippi. Two agents responded. One of the pitfalls of an intense media campaign are the many false sightings that well-intentioned citizens call in. The man in the bar was obviously not Rogers. The investigators tried to predict Rogers' next move and focus their search. Special Agent Huber had worked plenty of fugitive cases. A lot of times in fugitive investigations, when people are in trouble, they'll go to areas that they're familiar with or, or associates or friends. In this particular case, Rogers' family and friends were mostly located in the Kentucky area, and that's where a lot of our resources were focused. Authorities in Kentucky received priority teletypes about the fugitive. Kentucky State Police Detective Bob Stevens was already familiar with the name Glenn Rogers. In fact, he'd been looking for him for almost two years. Rogers was wanted for questioning in the disappearance and possible murder of his housemate, 71-year-old Mark Peters. Almost two years before Glenn Rogers' cross-country crime spree began, his brother had called the Kentucky State Police. Yeah, 
The body had been found inside his family's cabin. No, no, no. Police believed it was Mark Peters. Peters had last been seen with Rogers. The cord tied around the corpse's hands and feet matched one found in the home the men shared. Authorities could not determine the cause of death, and they couldn't find Rogers. The case is still ongoing and still pending. Uh, we had one suspect, which was Glenn Rogers. We weren't able to track Rogers real well uh, due to the fact that he traveled by uh, Greyhound bus, by tractor trailer, uh, cars. It was hard for us to track him. Uh, so we had a hard time trying to know where his next step was. Still, the investigative focus in Kentucky paid off. On November 13, 1995, Glenn Rogers visited one of his relatives in Lee County, Kentucky. When he left, she called the Kentucky State Police. Hi, I think you're looking for my nephew. She said he was driving a small white car heading west toward Interstate 75. When Detective Stevens heard that Rogers was sighted nearby, he set up on the road he believed Rogers would take to I-75. It wasn't long before a white Ford Festiva drove by. The detective began following. I wanted to make sure that this was Glenn Rogers, not somebody else that I had actually fallen in behind. So I pulled out behind this car. When I ran the car tags, the car tags actually came back stolen. So I began to follow him. I was able to get up, pull up beside him like I was going to pass. When I looked over, I could see who it was. And it, the picture I had of Glenn Rogers matched the driver. The detective requested backup. A local police officer was parked nearby. He joined the slow pursuit. They followed Rogers for a distance. I think he was kind of watching me, and I was watching him. And I think by then, he must have pretty much figured out that he had, he had a police officer behind him. So uh, we pulled up to a stoplight, and he ran the stoplight, uh, and pretty much ran some people off the road as he was going through a, the stoplight. I fell in behind him at that time and activated my emergency equipment. Rogers didn't stop. He sped up. He's on to us now. Stand by. Several miles ahead, police set up a roadblock and tried to clear the road of traffic. They hoped this would be the last stop for the elusive killer. On November 13, 1995, Kentucky State Police set up a roadblock in an effort to apprehend suspected serial killer Glenn Rogers. Armed officers waited at the roadblock. Shoot his tire! Shoot his tire! They fired at his tires, but they didn't stop the kill. Detective Bob Stevens was close behind. We followed him down the road. Uh, he had run several cars off the highway, ran a school bus off the highway. He was driving on the wrong side of the highway. And so it was determined that he had to be stopped. Sergeant Barnes would have to get up the other side of him. And when he came back, he tapped him, spun him out of the highway, off the highway into a ditch. They didn't know if the fugitive was armed. When I first approached the car, and I was one of the first ones to approach the car, uh, he, you could see that he, he looked very uh, upset, very uh, aggravated that he was in the custody. He was uh, very defiant and just didn't want to be taken into custody at that time.
after a two-month killing spree that spanned the country and left four women dead. Glenn Rogers was finally in custody. The vehicle identification number of the white Festiva confirmed the car belonged to Tina Marie Cribs, the victim in Florida. Technicians scoured the car for evidence. They found shorts with blood on them, a blanket, and a woman's purse. These and other items linked Rogers to the murders in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Florida. The FBI served as the clearinghouse for the evidence. FBI agents and detectives from five states met in Kentucky to outline the case. Special Agent John Huber helped plan the meeting. What they did do was put together all the information that everyone had, share information, and also that the FBI laboratory would process all the evidence in this case so that one agency would have custody of all the evidence and do the analysis. Agents and detectives agreed that their best case against Rogers was in Florida. Tampa detective Julie Masucci met with detectives and prosecutors to review the evidence. They believe the watch found in the tub with the victim belonged to Rogers. A photograph of Rogers with Mississippi victim Linda Price revealed he wore that type of watch. Detective Masucci was confident in her case due to the physical evidence implicating Rogers. We had Tina Cribb's car that he was apprehended in. We had some shorts that belonged to him that had some of T Tina Cribb's DNA on them. The registration slip that Mr. Rogers signed himself, fingerprints that were found inside of motel room number 119 where the victim was found, and miscellaneous items that were found inside of the car when he was apprehended. On July 11, 1997, almost two years after the murder of Tina Marie Cribbs in a Tampa motel room, Glenn Rogers was convicted of first-degree murder and later sentenced to death in Florida. Two years later, Rogers was extradited to Los Angeles to stand trial for the strangulation death of Sandra Gallagher, whose body was burned in a truck fire. She poured over the victim's body and in the cab of the truck. Prosecutors outlined the victim's final hours for the jury. They showed that Sandra and Glenn Rogers left McRed's bar together on September 28, 1995. At some point, there was a struggle, perhaps as Rogers made an unwanted sexual advance. He strangled her, crushing her windpipe. Attempting to destroy evidence, Rogers doused Sandra's body in the truck with gasoline and set it ablaze. Then he ran. On July 16, 1999, a jury again found Glenn Rogers guilty of murder. He was sentenced to a second death penalty in the state of California. Los Angeles detective Mike Koblenz was impressed by the nationwide partnership of everyone involved in the hunt for Rogers. 
that's really what made this case come together was the uh, interagency cooperation and, and not just in Los Angeles but in Jackson, Mississippi, Tampa, Florida and later uh, Boise City, Louisiana, the FBI, the press, the different news agencies that were able to get the information out. We truly worked together on this and, and it came to a successful conclusion down the road. Since Glenn Rogers already had two death sentences, Louisiana and Mississippi prosecutors decided to spare the families of the victims emotional trials. Glenn Rogers left at least 11 children without mothers. The importance of stopping him was clear to Detective Julie Masucci and the other investigators. As a woman, not as a detective, not as a police officer, but as a female, I think that there should be a lot of women that feel safe that he's off of the streets. He had no regard for human life. He had no regard for the feelings of the families that are left behind. He didn't care. And I'm happy that he's behind bars. And I'm happy that he'll never step foot outside of a prison system that he could put other females at risk. Investigators suspect Rogers is responsible for more unsolved murders. He told family members during his rampage that he had killed dozens. And authorities continue to pursue those unsolved murders to close the cases that can be linked to Glenn Rogers. <laughs>